So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one in four U.S. adults live with a disability. Um, among uh, younger adults, we're talking students here um, included, uh, cognitive disability is most prevalent. For the others, it would be mobility disability. But if you think about it, you know, um, virtually every single one of us can expect to experience some form of disability in our lifetime. And yet, in our society and in societies around the world, uh, we have still a lot of widespread misunderstandings, misperceptions, and stigma associated with disability and those who live with disability. I'm Henry Kwan from the Yale Alumni Association. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our panel discussion today entitled Diversibility, Addressing Disability, Equity, and Inclusion at Yale and Beyond. Uh, this program is part of a series of events taking place on campus and off this month in observance of National Disability Awareness Month. This particular program is a collaboration between the Alumni Association, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and Diversibility at Yale, which is a affinity group on campus for staff with disabilities. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to actually th thank a few people who uh, helped make this program possible. Uh, first is Melanie Norton, who's co-chair for day. Melanie? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we also have uh, Deborah Stanley McCauley, who's the Senior Diversity Officer on campus. I don't see her, but I uh, want to thank her nonetheless. And uh, last but not least, uh, Marinda Monfilston of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, who actually uh, took care of most of the logistics here. Um, so we hope that you will find this discussion informative, illuminating, and and uh, even perhaps inspirational, but we're certainly delighted to uh, bring you this lineup of speakers that we have here. So please join me in a warm round of applause for our speakers. much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jenny Lehrstein. I am a Yale class of 78, Saybrook College. Anybody here from Saybrook? Shout it out. Really? Seriously? I'm from the best residential college at Yale, Saybrook College. Um, and it is really wonderful to be home. My background is um, as a, an attorney. I'm retired from practice. Um, I'm also a disability rights advocate and a member of the disability community. Um, as you probably have guessed from the presence of uh, the, 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 the one who is undisputedly the most adorable in the room, my guide dog Shiloh, who is at my feet, uh, my disability is blindness. And I have the privilege of being moderator here today. So we're going to do a little bit of tactile interaction when we get to the Q&A session. Please just roll with me. This is going to work out just fine. I had the privilege of serving two terms uh, in the Obama administration on the National Council of Disability, serving as the senior disability policy advisor to the Hillary for America campaign. And I currently uh, am the vice chair finance for the DNC Disability Council, as well as a member of the National Board of the Foundation Fighting Blindness and a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Forum on Aging and Disability. We'll do some ground rules as soon as we've got everybody introduced, and I'm just so delighted you could be with us today. Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Poggi. I'm here in two capacities. I'll start with the professional one. I'm a graduate of the Yale School of Medicine, class of 1996, and I am a high-risk obstetrician. I take care of pregnant women with complications, um, medical complications, but also genetic complications. I do ultrasound um, and maybe diagnose babies with problems. And also in a consultative role, I do medical malpractice um, expert witness work on cases where a child may have been born with complications that are leading to lifelong disabilities. However, the reason I am here is more for a personal reason. Um, my medical school classmate, Dr. Matt Poggi, um, and I married in 1995, and two years later, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He ultimately became quadriplegic um, and from uh, C1 down, so he was unable to feed himself, really do any, anything except his cognition was excellent. 
and um, he died about six months ago. So um, I'm here to speak, I guess, as a caretaker, um, talk about how it was raising our two daughters in that home, and um, I actually am really happy to say I have a daughter who's here now, and she is in Saybrook, <laughs> 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 to your point. And, um, I'm, I'm going to end by saying how I got on Henry's radar. Um, there was a um, veterans, Yale veterans event in Washington, D.C., and my husband was a Navy doctor. Um, he did not step on a bomb in Fallujah, but he was a quadriplegic veteran, um, and he wanted to go to the event. And like any good caretaker, my first question was, is it accessible? And Henry found out that, unfortunately, the event for veterans was on the second floor of an inaccessible building. And I just expressed concern. <laughs> and um, maybe I was a little firm. <laughs> but I want to credit Henry with coming back in spades by saying, wow, you know, we need to do better for our, um, our um, alumni that are disabled in the community as a whole. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Conroy. I'm here from Pennsylvania. And I, uh, was here from 66 to 70 in Silliman College. And I studied brain research, physiological psychology. And <clears throat> uh, my life uh, got formed right after graduation. My first job was a study uh, for a consulting firm on the impact of a brand new law, the Developmental Disabilities Act of 1970. And my first task was to draw a sample of facilities nationwide to study uh, what would happen as a result of this new law. And drawing uh, purely at random, the first place to visit, I drew a place called Pennhurst State School and Hospital, which is one of the most notorious institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the world now. Uh, and going there uh, changed my life. I was in the midst of the women's movement, the anti-war movement. I was on a stage on May Day in 1970. I, I was in the thick of it. But when I saw this, these inhumane conditions, I knew something had to be done. And I've spent my whole life since then, trying to figure out what to do. But my role was simply scientist. So I thought, maybe somebody who studied the human brain could be useful in this field. And I went to Pennhurst and found that uh, there's a lot to do. In 1998, I went to Los Angeles to visit college friends. And we decided to go see the, the Holocaust Center, in which the first place I knew of that hands you an identity card, and you go through not knowing whether you lived or died in the Holocaust until the end. Three weeks later, I woke up back in Philadelphia in the middle of the night saying, the disability rights movement needs a place like that, a place where we'll never forget, where people can go by the millions and learn what's been happening. And <clears throat> I'm going to try to convince everybody for the rest of my life, probably, that we need a place of memory and learning in Washington. There are four great civil rights museums. One is in progress, but uh, there are three that are there on the mall now, and we'll be working for a fifth. The fourth, well, there's the, <clears throat> the Holocaust Memorial and Museum, National, uh, and the, uh, the National, the American Museum, Museum of the American Indian, the National Museum of American, African American History and Culture, and uh, the fourth is in progress, the National Women's History Museum, which was uh, a commission was set up in 2014. Uh, the fifth will be unnamed, uh, the National Center or American Museum on Disability Rights and History. And uh, <clears throat> every disability group will have to be represented. It's going to take an easy 10 years, uh, but it'll be a good 10 years to devote to. Thank you. My name is Sarah Scott Chang. I'm the Director of Student Accessibility Services here at Yale. We're the office that works with all students at the university that register with us and identify as having a disability. I am not a Yale alum, but I'm a Jonathan Edwards Fellow, which counts for something. Uh, my background is as an attorney, but I've spent most of my career working in disability issues in higher ed. Uh, we work with students in all issues of accessibility here on campus issues related to um, academic accommodations, to ensure that students can access their courses and their materials and their handouts and readings and PowerPoints in an accessible way. We work around issues of housing and physical accessibility of the campus infrastructure. 
which in a campus this old can be a challenging task sometimes. We work on issues around transportation and dining and, and there's really no um, edge, there's no boundary to what we do. Um, if we have a student that has an accessibility concern, we just do a lot of creative problem solving to try to find a way to meet that. Sometimes we're very successful and sometimes we're still working on it. Um, and I'm very honored to be here on this panel with such great speakers. I'm Paige Lawrence. I'm the token undergrad on this panel. <laughs> I'm the president of DEFI, which is Disability Empowerment for Yale, a student advocacy group. And I run the Disability Peer Mentor Program, which is in its third year. We now have 32 mentees. We just got our latest edition, and we have 11 mentors. So the program continues to grow throughout the semester. And I oversee all the matching of mentors and mentees. Uh, as DeFi president, we you know, work to advocate for the disabled community on campus. We uh, have events to build community. We do advocacy and awareness work. Uh, we've worked quite a bit with Day. Um, and I also want to say, on behalf of the students, we really appreciate what Student Accessibility Services does and how hard Sarah works for all of us. Um, so about myself, and not so much about the disability groups, I am in Hopper College, formerly known as Calhoun. So, not Saybrook, <laughs> yay! Um, and I'm a history and Near Eastern languages and civilizations double major, studying Egyptology in the latter. Um, I plan to study the history of disabilities, although we don't have a separate disability studies program. So I am studying disabilities in the context of different ancient civilizations and pre-modern civilizations. I personally got involved with this because in my senior year of high school, I was diagnosed with an immunodeficiency, which is a type of invisible illness, a chronic disability. Um, and as a result, you know, I've had to navigate the bureaucracy of Yale Health, getting approved for infusions my freshman year of college. Now I receive monthly infusions and I have to navigate, you know, my class schedule around my infusion schedule. Um, and it has really changed my life and my perspective on, you know, how to stay organized, how to deal with different challenges as they arise. Um, it's totally changed my perspective and as a result, I became very involved with the disability community on campus. Thank you, everybody. So uh, as I stated previously, it is my great privilege to be the moderator of the panel this morning. So we're going to set a couple of ground rules. First of all, even though I am uh, here to gently guide the discussion, uh, we want to make sure that everybody's opinions are heard. And so we're going to reserve some time for questions and comments at the end of the session today. And we encourage everyone to keep track of what they would like to say so that we have an opportunity to be sure that everyone in the room is heard. Uh, secondly, it is uh, part of my responsibility as monitor uh, to be the time police. Um, and because we have so much to discuss in this very broad talk of, topic of disability uh, identity, inclusion, and accessibility, both in terms of here at Yale and, and throughout the nation, um, we are going to keep to some pretty strict time limits. Um, if an answer from anybody in the room goes to more than three or four minutes, you will probably see me rise and gently stand next to you or behind your chair. That's the first hint. The second hint is likely gonna be a little tap on your shoulder, hopefully I'll be able to find it. But here's the kicker. If you do not desist, then the final element is on secret signal to my four-legged assistants here. Shiloh is gonna kiss you all over your face until you stop talking. <laughs> so with that said and the ground rule set, uh, we have really a lot to discuss, and we're going to dispense with the urban legend of age be before beauty and go right to our current undergraduate student. Uh, Paige, thank you for being with us. And I I'm wondering if you would open the discussion with us by just talking a little bit about what you found the most surprising thing, good and bad, when you entered Yale as a student with a disability. Thank you. So I want to start off by saying that when I was a first year, so I'm currently a junior, when I was a first year, I was still navigating the diagnosis process, uh, coming to terms with the fact that I was now disabled, this was lifelong, I would have to receive treatment for the rest of my life. Um, it's not something that would just go away or be a temporary obstacle. Um, and for the first year, I was sort of in denial that this was a part of my life. Uh, I wasn't involved with the disability community at all. Um, but then my sophomore year, I signed up for the peer mentor program. 
and I found a lot of individuals who, you know, like me, have struggled with this new identity of being disabled or having a disability on this campus and who have faced different challenges. Um, and I very quickly started learning about the other types of disabilities on campus and how hidden or visible they are and how accessible this campus is or sometimes the lack thereof of accessibility. Um, you know, how hard student accessibility services work, what the accommodations are. In fact, I just learned last week that there's a new accommodation I could have taken advantage of when I was concussed last year. Um, so there are all sorts of resources. And I think what surprised me the most was how decentralized the community and the resources here are and how hard it is to navigate, especially when you weren't born with a disability because for some of my peers who are born with their disabilities, they've navigated their whole life, it's second nature, it's not this new additional challenge. Whereas for me, it was just a whole new world of figuring out how it affected me personally and figuring out how to navigate it on this campus at the same time. So I found that the decentralization of resources was the most surprising thing on this campus, but then the most positive surprise was how strong the community of disabled students here is through groups like Defy and the Peer Mentor Group. I had a fantastic peer mentor my sophomore year. I, she's still one of my best friends. She graduated last year, and she's the one who started the peer mentorship program uh, just over two and a half years ago now. And uh, the, the bond that we built over the shared experience of having a chronic illness and being disabled on this campus is so strong. One of the strongest bonds I think you can form is having the shared experience of being a disabled student on this campus, even if your disability is wildly different. It is still such a unifying experience. So I was pleasantly surprised by the strength of the community um, and the passion of the students that I've been involved with on this campus. Thank you. So Sarah Scott Chang, that kind of leads us into a lot of directions um, in terms of your very important role in assisting uh, students at Yale with disabilities and also interacting with the faculty and staff, some of whom also are dealing with the challenges of disability. We heard talk about um, the diffuse element of the disability community. That's something that, that permeates uh, disability community nationally. And we also heard a little talk about the uh, accessibility issues that are, are certainly profound when you're trying to fully integrate students with disabilities. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, what your life has been like, uh, assuming the mantle of, of the, the head of this uh, very important department at Yale, and what you have viewed as uh, some of your biggest challenges and successes? So our office has had a lot of really um, kind of radical changes over the last year that have, I think, worked really hard to uh, increase our efficiency and increase the um, accessibility uh, for students. Um, we just recently changed our name about a month ago from Resource Office on Disabilities to Student Accessibility Services, and we have had overwhelmingly positive feedback on that. Um, and I think that that goes a long way toward increasing the visibility of our office to students that maybe were not born with a disability and are kind of new to their diagnosis. Also students with uh, mental health conditions that don't, the word disability doesn't really resonate with them. Um, and it more accurately defines the work that we do. We work to create accessibility. Um, and that's been a really good change. We've in increased a lot of our internal efficiency um, in ways that students very much appreciate, um, kind of brought our practices up to date so students don't have to come physically pick up papers from us every semester and then physically take them to their faculty. We've gone digital and paperless and that's been, I think, a really good change for students. Um, some of the challenges that we see is I think Yale has a culture of um, perfection, almost, where everyone is expected to be perfect in the thing that they do. And there's not a lot of grace allowed for people who are not perfect, for people who are struggling, for people who are still trying to learn something. And that affects the, the community of students with disabilities because there is the stigma that if you have a disability, that's a weakness, that's a deficiency. Um, and I wholeheartedly do not believe that, but um, a lot of people do. Even students with disabilities have kind of internalized that idea. Um, so I think that there's a lot of room for 
the campus to grow and, and just be a little bit more progressive in terms of what disability means. Um, the people who say my disability is my superpower, I think there's a lot of value there. Um, and just understanding that people learn in really different ways, that uh, taking an exam that's 80 multiple choice questions and that being the only grade for a course might not be the best way to evaluate a student's knowledge of material every time. Uh, and just kind of allowing people to understand that students can look a lot of different ways and if it doesn't look the way you are or the way that you expect, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad or worse or weak or less. It's just different and that's okay. So thank you so much for that comment, and we're already starting to see a couple of themes emerge here in terms of the a fact that uh, identity in the disability community is something that is unique to every person with a disability, but also in terms of the kinds of expectations and supports, and now the first discussion of stigma. Um, I'm going to skip right over you, Jim, for just one second, because stigma has been raised as an issue uh, by Sarah to our other Sarah. Um, this is, a, a, I think, a rare privilege on a panel for us to have someone um, who has uh, sat with this really many, many hats and um, vistas into the various elements of the disability community, um, both as a, a family member who has been um, so uh, recently involved in the end of life process, and I'm sure everyone here um, agrees with me in sending condolences to you and your family for your recent loss. Um, also, as a, a physician who sees the side of uh, diagnosis and treatment of, uh, in this case, women with disabilities, and um, moreover, and I want to get to this with my question, uh, a member of the caregiving and supporter network that, that surrounds people with disabilities if they're fortunate enough to have families. So we know 61 million Americans are challenged by disabilities, but that number grows exponentially if you consider the family members who are caregivers and loved ones and supporters and all of the work that they do that is usually largely uncompensated and hardly ever recognized. So uh, Sarah, could you talk to us a little bit about what your perspective is as part of this kind of shadowy existence behind the disability community? Um, I'll say I was bone tired for the four years that he was quadriplegic. Um, I was the medical director of my unit at work. I did not miss a single day of work because my income mattered terribly to pay for his care. Um, and we had, basically I was then the medical director of a nursing home for one person at home. And um, he was taking up to 35 pills a day. I had six aides. Um, you know, all sorts of durable medical goods that I was having to keep track of, um, you know, things, you know, he was admitted to the hospital, I think, 29 times in four years, 11 surgeries, including an amputation of his left leg because of a pressure sore, because we couldn't get AIDS in during a blizzard. It was just, it was a lot. And at the same time, I have two girls that are, um, one was in seventh grade, when he became quadriplegic, the other ninth grade, the girl who's now at Yale, but I became um, a single parent for them. He was, of course, present to them, and they would watch TV or do, you know, do things like this together. But um, they say, Mom, we were down to half a parent because we lost Dad, and you spent so much time with him that we didn't have much of you. So um, I have some guilt right now because like, I wouldn't have been able to come up and do this if he were alive. I mean, there's an irony in all of this um, because I always had to have you know, care for him set up. Um, I just know that because we had had his diagnosis of MS early um, and we were both physicians, we had healthy incomes and we saved. So we were ready for our rainy day. It came earlier than we expected, um, but we, we could do it. And I just fear for the people out there that didn't have the resources that we did to navigate the healthcare system and to have a nest egg to, to go into because we, we weren't bankrupt by it. I mean, we definitely took a hit. Um, I have, um, I, I don't know if any of you have had someone like this in the home, but I have, I have guilt because I would get frustrated. I would work all day, um, come home, you know, have to cook dinner, feed them with my hands, um, and, and sometimes I, would, I, would, I wasn't the nicest, and I have a lot of guilt about that. Um, I, I'm trying to think what else yeah, to, to say. I just, I'm really proud I never put him in a nursing home, though. I, I'm so proud of that. 
So that's maybe the best point for us to jump off and talk about what Jim has witnessed in his many years um, working with the disability community and also his aspiration to make sure that there is an institute of learning where people can uh, come to understand the disability community. We have already heard many of the major words that are associated with our community. Inclusion, accessibility, support, caregiving, frustration, guilt. So assuming that we get this Civil Rights Museum up and going in or around Washington, D.C., what is the message that you would like this institution to send to people who are not as engaged as we are in the disability community? Oh, it's, uh, it's education. It's uh, learning. It's, uh, people don't understand. They don't know. They don't know the history of disabilities. They don't know the pain of exclusion. And I think if we had a place uh, like the National Museum of African American History and Culture, where millions of people come through. It's the most record-breaking thing. And as you said, 61 million Americans with disabilities and their families. This museum would be a big step in learning to accept and include. And that's the number one message. It's not just learning. It's actual action, which is what the NMAHC does. It's, it's not just learning about history. It's taking action and changing attitudes. So you, you used one of my favorite words, which is action. Um, I, I'm sure everybody who has been part of the Yale experience, and particularly those of us who are uh, students here at Yale, have some significant memory of that aha moment where a teacher really got through to us with words that have stayed with us their whole life. So you just mentioned one. I was fortunate enough to be a, a history student here at Yale, and my senior advisor was John Morton Blum, who was one of the iconic history uh, professors. And in our first meeting when I went shaking with fear to talk to him about my proposal for my senior thesis uh, project, he sat me down and he said, I don't care what you write about, I don't care how much you research, you need to understand that I will not tolerate, tolerate anything that is not in the active tense. No passivity, mm -hmm. no past tense, no subjunctives, forget those rules. I only want to hear from you in the active tense. And I think that's what you're talking about, Jim. So a number of years ago, I'm go, go, going to go back to Sarah Scott Chang over there. Um, Yale made a remarkable statement in yeah. announcing that they were going to go completely digital in order to uh, step towards full inclusion for uh, the Yale institution and for their extended community. And they are now requiring um, that not only uh, everything on campus, but that all of the vendors make all of their information available in digital fashion. This is good news for someone like me who's blind. But uh, Sarah, I wonder if you could help us understand what that means in terms of Yale taking on a leadership role and how that transition is going currently. Uh, yeah, I, it means that a lot of people are able to access a lot of things that they couldn't otherwise, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, we have some of our digital accessibility folks in the room, Mike Vaughn and Michelle Morgan. Um, the CTL does a lot of things working around accessibility, and they've been really amazing partners. Um, we work with students for course materials. We work directly with faculty so that they can remediate things on their end. This can be people who um, have been blind throughout their life and rely on a screen reader like JAWS that reads everything they see on their screen. It can also include students who just got a concussion and, and have an intolerance for looking at screens for the next three weeks. And suddenly they're able to listen to their readings instead of visually scanning it on their laptop. And it's been really, really amazing. Um, I've heard from a number of outside of the community people, vendors and, and just other people that, that use different parts of Yale, um, that, that the push toward digital accessibility has been really helpful on their end in being able to access materials, but also in modeling that kind of um, best practice behavior. So along the lines of best practice, Paige, I just want to know how that best practice philosophy feels to you as a person who is engaged as a student. And I know that the digital element is not so much associated with your personal uh, experience as a student at Yale, but can you talk to us a little bit about what the disability culture is here at Yale and how you feel inclusion and integration um, exists or is, is coming along for the disability community of students? Yeah, so that's, that's a big uh, 
That's right. That's a big question that we've been working on lately. Um, how to create this community at Yale of students with disabilities and how to make it more inclusive. So we've taken certain steps like becoming affiliated with cultural centers on campus. Uh, we just affiliated with the Asian American Cultural Center on campus because we're trying to be more intersectional in our outreach. Uh, we've worked with other student groups that are not disability related inherently, but that do intersect with disability. Um, we've worked with different faculty groups. We've been reaching out to grad students and working more with the graduate groups and helping foster graduate groups as well. Um, and overall, we're just trying to get everyone involved in this community in the same room because we've been so fragmented empirically um, that getting everyone in the same space, on the same page, even just in contact has been huge this year. Um, a new divinity school group is forming currently. A new graduate group is hopefully coming soon. Um, there, there are a lot of new groups you know, on the rise and working with DEFI and the Disability Peer Mentor Program. And we're also trying to create you know, longevity for our groups, a lasting impact that will last even after I've graduated. And you know, the founder of the Peer Mentor Program recently graduated and handed it off to me. And we want to make sure that there continue being these transitions um, and that these programs don't just die off once we graduate. We want there to be institutional memory as well. And you know, another way that we're working together as a community is that we pooled our collective experiences at Yale and created a resource guide to disability at Yale. It is a 26-page document viewable online. Um, and for anyone who wants the link, I can give it to you. It's just tinyurl.com slash disability at Yale. And it's this complete resource using all of our experiences with different types of disabilities to help others in our community understand what exists and what communities exist on this campus. It includes a section about different student groups that are involved with disability. There's you know, a club that does ASL now. There's all these different smaller groups that are tangentially involved in the community um, and help build and grow the network and outreach that we have. Um, so we've worked very hard to reach a larger portion of the student body, and I think the peer mentor program is the single best way in which we've expanded our outreach. Um, and you know, last year we had 20 some mentors. By the end of the year, this year we're in the 30s and still growing, or mentees, and we're still growing. Um, and I think that that alone just says a lot about how more people are getting involved in the community, more people want to be involved in the community. Um, and I will say also on the peer mentor forms, when you fill out a form to request a mentor, there's a question that asks, how much do each of these things matter to you? And one of them is connection with resources. One of them is mentorship. And one of the options is connection with the broader community of students with disabilities at Yale. Most of the mentees, when they fill out that form, say that that matters the most to them, connection with the broader community here at Yale. So it's clear that students here want to be connected with other students who, like them, have gone through the experience of being disabled at Yale. And people want to be a part of a larger network here at Yale. So we're working on building that network the best we can, because it's clear that students want to be a part of this network and want to be involved in these you know, subgroups and this larger community. So we're doing everything we can to make this a reality. It certainly sounds like you are. So I just want to do one quick follow-up question here. It won't count into your rebuttal time, don't worry. Um, you, you talked about um, doing things the best you can, and it certainly sounds like the engaged effort from the side of the students um, who are within the disability community is beyond anything I think that I, I could possibly have imagined all those years ago when I was here at Yale. Um, but how is it really in terms of acceptance by the non-disabled peers that you have at Yale? Is it possible, for example, for someone in a wheelchair to be a member of one of the singing groups or on the stage at, at Yale Drama? Um, how easy is it um, to form those personal relationships to students with disabilities date at Yale? Um, just in terms of general acceptance, could you give us some kind of a picture? Yeah, so not to pull on specific names, but the Defy Vice President and Treasurer are currently dating each other. <laughs> so I think people with disabilities do date on this campus. Um, mm. But more broadly speaking, everyone in Defy is involved with a lot of other groups on campus. Um, in fact, the Vice President and Treasurer of Defy are involved in a production of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
I think, in two days. Um, and so they're going to be on the stage involved in that, and our treasurer is going to be wearing a corset. Our treasurer is a dude, by the way, just throwing that out there. So the people in Defy, at the very least, I know, are very involved in lots of student groups. We've got you know, someone who's an a cappella on campus. We've got you know, a wide range of representation across the different student groups that exist, music, arts. Uh, there's athletic involvement. We have some club athletes. So people are really getting involved um, on this campus, you know, regardless of whether they have a disability or not. And it seems that student groups are generally very supportive of having students with disabilities in those groups. Um, so I think the culture on campus is a lack of knowledge, but a general willingness to support. It sounds like one of the characteristics of Yale students everywhere. So thank you for sharing that. And here's a shout out to True Love at Yale. Um, my husband and I, who is Davenport, class of 78, are married now 38 years. So there, there is possibility for life and marriage after Yale, even all those years ago. Um, I, I want to switch back to Jim for just a moment. Uh, Jim, you in the class of 70, um, me, class of 78, we're kind of rising seniors in that very large perspective of the journey of life. Uh, what do you see as a potential role for some of us who have had a lot of experience in this community in uh, providing expertise or uh, just association with the Yale community here on campus or throughout the nation? That's a funny question for me. I never took a history course at Yale. I never took an English course. I never took an art course. I took all science. And now, I'm 70 years old, and history is suddenly fascinating. I, I don't, know, don't know what happened. <laughs> but uh, my answer is it's to provide that sense of what came before, history. Um, I got here in 66, and I've been racking my brains for years. I can't think of anybody with any kind of visible disability at Yale in 1966. And yet, of course, mental illness was underneath many of our, our experiences, and some of my friends wound up in bad places because of it. But we have a history of Yale that goes back further. The American Eugenics Society, from about 1870 to 1930, the world was consumed with eugenics as a leading belief in social science. Eugenics, from the Greek meaning good birth, was the idea that people who are different, people who are lesser than the master race, should be eliminated from the gene pool entirely. That's eugenics. The AES was on Elman Grove. The headquarters was at Yale. So our history is long and grim. And so really, I think those of us who have been around a long time can tell a story of tragedy and triumph because so much has changed in our lifetime. When I graduated, 1970, we didn't have free appropriate public education in American schools. That happened because of a lawsuit at that same institution, Pennhurst, in 1971, called the Right to Education. And it was won because children who were not allowed in public school were being sent to institutions at roughly adolescence. The ARC, the Association then for Retarded Children of Pennsylvania, filed suit and won the Right to Education. Four years later, it was national law. Now, my children went to school with all kinds of kids and teachers with disabilities, and it's made such a difference in automatic acceptance and the feeling of big deal. That's, I think, where we want to get to. So that leads us back to both of our Sarahs. I think let's start first with Sarah Scott Ching and your discussion about the work, and we know that it's hard work that you do in order to ensure that students with disabilities at Yale have the opportunity uh, equally with students who are, do not have disabilities to engage and choose their classes um, and really be fully involved like any other student. Uh, when we're looking at towards that goal of full inclusion, what would you say we need to do on Yale's campus in order to get to that next step where inclusion is a, a given, um, where, uh, as, as Paige has told us, it's easy for students with disabilities to uh, be in the broader community for extracurricular activities, but also in terms of the core educational work that goes on here, um, classes, studying, examinations. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I like, like Paige said, I think that, that the people at Yale want to do the right thing. I, people want to be inclusive. People want to be on the right side of history. And sometimes they just don't know how to do that. 
Um, there was an amazing panel last week um, with Paige and a number of her student colleagues uh, on how to build an inclusive classroom at Yale. Um, it was great and they talked about, as a, from a student's perspective, what it means to be going to class and have some assignment or materials or whatever it might be in your academic program that's there but you can't quite access it. Uh, because of the way the professor is presenting it, because of the requirements of the course. Um, and a lot of that could be uh, fixed if, if there was less of a concern of this is the way we do it because this is the way we've done it for the last 300 years um, and more of a mindset of how can I make my course and this information available and accessible to the most number of students in the most number of ways because not everybody learns the same way. And if the goal of a class is for students to learn information uh, and to, to have mastery of that information, there's a lot of different ways that that can be done. So I would really love to see uh, more of an inclusion mindset across campus, especially in the faculty, because I think they are in a great position of power and, and can model that kind of behavior for everyone. Um, students also, I think students are naturally uh, tend to be a little more inclusive. Um, faculty, staff, everybody, um, just thinking about how can we make this thing, whether it's a class or a student event or a, a talk like this, more accessible to more people. So, Sarah, other Sarah, <laughs> Sarah Boji, um, you've told us um, with such great depth of feeling about the frustration and the guilt and also the cost involved in caring for a loved one who is in the final stages of dealing with a disability. Uh, we know that this is true throughout all of the stages uh, for a person who is challenged by disability. And I'm wondering if you could, um, in your capacity as a, a professional caregiver, as a physician, talk a little bit about what you think could be done in order to ensure accessibility of medical care, both in terms of the availability of physicians, physicians with disabilities, and also the cost issues that we're facing. Wow, that's a, yeah. So I take care of, of pregnant women, um, and I have taken care of women um, with spinal cord injuries um, who give birth, um, it, um, and there's unique considerations with that. In terms of, I work in a hospital, so my hospital is completely accessible. So that's not been a, a challenge for me. But um, may I mention the, the discussion we had last night about the mammograms? Because this was actually something that was brought on my radar because it's not something I deal with. But for example, women, when they have mammograms, have to be standing. And um, this is not, having a mammogram device that will accommodate a woman who is seated is not readily available. And so this is the sort of thing that um, needs to be on people's radar um, because just because you're disabled doesn't mean you can't get breast cancer. Um, so that would be an example. What was the, the follow-up of your question? That I was, was just uh, hoping yeah. you might also help us understand uh, a little bit about the cost. This is a major discussion raging across the nation right now in terms of how, of how we deal with the availability and cost of health care. And perhaps um, you could share some of your thoughts about uh, best ways to wrap the disability community in in a meaningful way. Well, it's, it's, everything's getting dismantled right now. It's terrible. And I have patients that are, I, mean, I practice in Virginia, which is not Mississippi, but I have patients that have lost um, insurance because of the dismantling of Obamacare. Um, and so people will choose, um, you know, they may, I'll, get, I'll give an example of a diabetic, which isn't um, necessarily a disabled person, but they'll ration their insulin. Um, that puts a baby then at risk for a stillbirth. Um, so I don't know what the solution is. I, I feel like that's way above my pay grade. Um, is there a way I could address, though, something he brought up with the eugenics? Absolutely, go right ahead. So in my capacity as a high-risk OBGYN, um, I feel like almost what you're saying, what's old is new again. Um, ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, um, um, mandates that we offer all pregnant couples screening for 108 genetic diseases. And so if a couple finds out that their child may have this, and additionally we're doing 18-week ultrasounds to look to see if the babies have birth defects, the couples are now faced with a difficult decision. And um, this, these are births that would have happened a generation ago without anybody knowing that they um, had a child that might have a particular problem. 
So I definitely, in the um, privacy of my doctor's offices, am seeing patients make the decision to terminate children that would be born with disabilities. And that's a really complicated topic. It was complicated for me with a husband who is disabled that I love terribly. Um, but I have to, of course, be, um, just provide support for whatever decision and, and um, be in compliance with the law. But I think there is a movement for any of you that have been pregnant recently or have people that are pregnant in your life, you may be aware that this is, um, the pendulum's kind of switching a little bit with the science advancing with all the testing that we can do on fetuses. So the bioethics concern for people in the disability community is something that has really been prominent, um, both in situations like the one you're describing, where uh, people are uh, being offered or forced to make choices um, about uh, welcoming someone with a disability um, into the world and their family, um, and also on the broader topics that engage all of us, healthcare, education, transportation, housing, perhaps most prominently in the news, the discussion about the ethics around self-driving cars. Uh, we know that that would be of tremendous value to someone like me who is blind. I haven't been able to drive since I was 26 years old. Um, and yet there are uh, ethical considerations and pushbacks, how these algorithms work in terms of making a decision about what happens if a collision has to occur. Do you select to have less impact to the car that has a baby carrier in the back seat? Do you decide that it's not so important if we know that the driver is over the age of, well, in deference to Jim and myself, let's say 85? <laughs> yeah, uh, these are very important issues that might Henry be the subject of another discussion at the Yale, the Yale community, um, or perhaps among the, the alumni, uh, to talk about the ethics that are involved in these very difficult decisions. So we want to go to some Q&A, but before we do that, I'd like to engage with all of you in what um, I like to think of as a last round rapid fire answer. So get ready with one sentence or less as an answer to this question. I'm going to start with Paige and just move right across the panel. And the question is this. Uh, 2020 marks the 30th anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We literally have people sitting at these, this table who lived most of their lives before that became a law. And then we have Paige, who has lived her entire life, the recipient of the benefits of that law. So next year in 2020, but then let's just push it 10 years out. In one sentence or less, what do you want to see as the most important focus for the disability and engaged community going forward? Paige? Yeah. It's rapid fire. So <laughs> in, in lieu of a more you know, complicated answer, I would say a really important element of the disability conversation going forward, you know, so in 10 years from now, um, I would really love to see the focus of the disability community shifting from receiving accommodations to, okay, everyone's accommodated. The next step is building better community and making it so people aren't afraid of disability and being disabled. And this also goes back to the eugenics conversation, not being afraid to have a disabled child, for example, like they are today. Even with the existing accommodations, it's still so stigmatized that people are afraid of disability. Sarah? So my answer is kind of similar to Paige's in that I would like to see a world where my office didn't need to exist, yeah. where mm. we didn't need to make accommodations because everything was universal design and, and accommodations weren't needed because everyone could access everything at any time. Might be a few more than 10 years from now, but. <laughs> Jim? Uh, on September 6, 2018, the New York Times published an article, an op-ed by five high school students called It's Time for a National Museum on Disabilities. I give us 10 years. All right. That's right. And Sarah? This is real simple. Don't park in my handicapped spot <laughs> 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 when I got the van. <laughs> I echo that sentiment. Uh, so, you know, I, as moderator, I, I just want to um, first of all, thank all of our panelists for being just really both attentive to um, the topic of conversation and for sharing your insight. Um, I want to answer my own question in one word in 10 years. I, I want to see us as fully included. And I mean fully included. So don't tell me you don't want my dog in your restaurant. 
don't kick me out of your Uber. Don't tell me that I can't be part of a book club even though I can no longer read and am technically illiterate. Just let us in. So with that, I'm going to ask Henry to come back and steal my microphone again so that we can oh, take some comments right and he's questions. Where are you? Oh, oh. oh OK. Oh. Who we got? Oh, oh so, uh, I'm sorry. sorry. I got confused. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, that was super. I'm uh, Richard Kane, Med School 76. I'm curious about the educational piece at Yale. Uh, we have Dean Chun here as well, perhaps. I'm just wondering if there is um, some room in the curriculum uh, in orientation uh, at the med school. We're now looking at putting disability into the curriculum. There's a tiniest snippet in orientation. As a physician, I was never taught anything about disability. I merely acquired it by one-on-one -on -one experience. Even how to deal with people in wheelchairs, there is literally no teaching at Yale Med School at this point. So that educational piece, I think, would be really important, not only um, in the medical school, but across all of uh, the university. And I would love to see um, that opportunity be developed. Well, I can speak to um, what we do for education. I am that little bit of education at the med school right now. Um, I spend the summer going out to all the different programs, orienting the new students, talking about our office and what we do reminding the medical students that, that disability exists, but I can't, I can't provide the curriculum for them, and I agree that that is something that, that would be really great, because this is something that, as healthcare practitioners, they're gonna be dealing with probably every day of their lives. Um, so we have, have worked on increasing our kind of community outreach and, and getting students as they come in the door to tell them who we are and what we do and, and not to forget that we exist, but I think there's a lot of room for growth in yeah, the our curriculum. Our University, Darren Landmore, is actually looking at putting this into the curriculum and hiring uh, a staff for disabilities for moving that oh. Great. I also want to add from an undergraduate perspective, so not necessarily a medical school perspective, but in terms of you know finding areas and ways in which to learn about disability, I found that I've had to create the curriculum myself within existing classes. So as a history major studying the history of disabilities, I've taken classes on random ancient civilizations where you know the, the whole seminar leads up to this term paper on whatever topic you choose within the field of study. And I make that topic paper about disability in that ancient civilization or whatever it is. I try to apply it and I have to actively, you know, teach myself, do that own research, write the paper myself and create that disability um, education that I would like to have. Um, but I have found, you know, every year there's usually one or two courses, often in the psychology department, that talk about working with uh, children with disabilities. And I think that's about the extent of the undergraduate curriculum that is generally provided. There's also History of Science, History of Medicine and Public Health, so HSHM, um, as a department, occasionally talks more to disability or mentions it in one week of the entire class. Um, and so there are small areas of opportunity where if you are really looking for it, you can find it once per semester, one week per semester, but there is no overarching curriculum or way for students not interested in disability to be exposed to it in an academic context, which I think is also very important for normalizing disability. So Paige, Sarah, just to follow that up, do you think that it would be reasonable to envision a day where there is a, a major uh, disability rights and advocacy, the way we've developed majors for American studies? So I'll jump in really quickly and say that one of Defy's long-term goals is to get some sort of disability studies program at Yale. Um, it's a very long-term goal I know right now with ethnicity, race, and migration. That's been just a whole other topic about you know getting that approved as a field of study and getting hiring power for the faculty. Um, and you know we would like ultimately to have something similar where disability studies has like one or two faculty members over time even more um, and that students can study it. Um, studying the history of disability advocacy, things like that, not just studying it in a medical context as you know disabled bodies to be studied from a medical perspective, but as disabled individuals to understand, to learn about, to learn the history of. Um, and I think that's one of our ultimate goals. Um, so I, I would like to see some sort of, not necessarily major, but a program of study here at Yale. 
I Sarah? completely agree with Paige. I, I think that it would go really, really far toward building community um, and, and building that inclusive tenure from now world where disability is just another facet of life and just another identity that people can have. Your question was whether it's reasonable. I'm not sure about well, that, but I think I it think, would be a great thing to I do. I think in terms of reasonability, already we're seeing some support from certain departments here at Yale, like Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies, WGSS, has been pretty supportive um, and willing to potentially include some disability studies in their curriculum. So that would be you know, an avenue for us to pursue, would be starting out by having disability studies offered within a larger studies program and then eventually branching off into its own studies program. So I want to ask our friend out here in the audience that raised the question. Um, what has it been your experience in terms of uh, people in the medical community, doctors, nurses, assistants uh, with disabilities, uh, being, being part of the caregiving community um, and interacting with patients? Have you experienced that and do you want to see more of it? Oh, definitely. So there's a, uh, an alum, I think it's He operates um, uh, doing OBGYN surgery using a lift, uh, and they have created a way for him to do his practice despite his disability. I've had classmates uh, with um, minor disabilities, but I've also seen people at the school um, who have more significant disability, and the hope is that they can continue to practice and have the school accommodate, have the patients accommodate. I think when you have a caregiver in a wheelchair, there's often a transfer where people think that um, the doctor has a bigger problem than the patient does, and you really have to negotiate that. Um, I think that we have a lot to learn, and uh, you know, I'm excited that, uh, that we're talking about that today. May I address, my husband worked for, um, I mean, he had a, a cane like you did for most of his working career as an oncologist, and he switched from um, surgery to onco um, radiation oncology because he didn't have the dexterity. But he worked for six months in an electric wheelchair at my hospital, and I would go empty his Foley and give him his meds. But his cancer patients were so receptive to him. I mean, I think it was because they were end of life patients themselves. It was beautiful, and then he got too sick to do it anymore. But he did not lose his practice in a quadriplegic. And yeah. he had a scribe, and, you know. Yeah, very courageous. Yeah. So. More questions? Thank you all so much. Uh, Sarah, I love what you said about sort of making your office obsolete. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if part of that is teaching students the self-advocacy skills to kind of know what they need and, and ask for it and how to do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that 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 can be a, a really big hurdle for students to get over when they first come as a first year because the laws that apply in the K through 12 world are very different than the laws that apply in higher ed and and they go through K through 12 with their parents and their teachers and administrators just all knowing what the disability is knowing what the accommodations are and everything just kind of happening for them almost magically and then they get here and cross some invisible line that they never knew existed and then suddenly they have to advocate for themselves and they're in our office crying because they have no idea how any of this works. Um, so we try to first off be very uh, patient and sympathetic and understanding with students when they first get here because it is a lot to suddenly have to advocate for yourself especially if you've never done it before. It's intimidating, it's daunting. I had a student break down and cry one time when she understood that she needed to tell her faculty that she used accommodations and she just started crying and said, but he's a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> and how can I possibly have that conversation with him? Um, so I think that is tough. And then especially in the realm of invisible disabilities, um, there can be an extra layer of difficulty there because if you're having conversations with people and they can't see and understand that you're a person with a disability and they just kind of have to take your word for it. Some people have a hard time with that um, and, and they really grapple with, um, you know, why, why, why is uh, bipolar? Why would that be a disability? Can't you just toughen up and get over it? So being a self-advocate in the face of that can be really hard for anyone and especially a young person who's also trying to come to college and learn all the other things that 18 year olds are learning. So I do think self-advocacy is really important, but I also think that um, 
all the onus shouldn't be put on the student to do that, right? There needs to also be kind of a culture change in the community at large that's more accepting of those things and more understanding of things even if they can't see it. Hi, I was wondering um, what percentage of the undergraduate population and you know the other schools as well currently identifies as a person with disability, both physical or mental health problems, and would you consider that you are an underserved or under, not underserved necessarily, but underrepresented minority at Yale? And the point that you made about it being a place of perfection is that something that prevents many students who could contribute here from even arriving on campus and contributing in various ways? Uh, so we have about 10% of the student population registered with our office. I, I don't really know the breakdown for undergrad versus all the professional schools off the top of my head. Um, my sense is that it's about the same across all the schools. Um, that 10% is students who have a, a lifetime disability, students who are new to a diagnosis like Paige was her first year, students who got a concussion a couple weeks ago and are just dealing with that for the rest of this semester. So it's a really wide range of things. Some use accommodations throughout their entire time here. Some students use it just for a, a kind of finite period of time as they're recovering. We have students that have situations that are sporadic and they might be heavy users of accommodations one semester and then not, not want anything to do with us for the next year. Um, but generally about 10% of the student population. I do think we are under-resourced um, <laughs> in the sense that there's a lot of other work that we could do. Um, as it is, we're, we're, we're making accommodations for things that come up, right? So a, a student's in a class and they have some material that they can't access, so we're working to make it so that they can access that reading. If we had more resources, we could do more front-end work and, and work directly with the faculty and make sure that all materials are going to be digitally accessible for all classes moving forward, so then we don't have to do those accommodations case-by-case um, -case basis. Um, I think I'm trying to put our office out of <laughs> work a number of times, but I do think that there's a lot of room for that kind of um, extra resources could help us do that work better. And then also kind of to what Paige has talked about, um, there's a lot of community building that needs to happen. Um, our office is kind of more for compliance, so I'm not sure exactly where the right fit is for that, but I do think there's a, a real need for and a value in building a community at the university generally, and there's a lot of room for growth there. Sarah, also. could you take that just one step further? And uh, The elephant in the room we really haven't talked a lot about is mental health and mental illness. Uh, we all know that uh, suicide is a, a crisis situation in all campuses across the nation and around the world. And um, I have heard tell of some peer support groups uh, here and at other universities. Would you like to comment on what your department does in terms of uh, helping students in that crisis? So we're not mental health clinicians. Um, and we like to make that very clear, right? We are not the kind of first stop. If you're in a crisis, then we will help you get to the right people. We'll help you get connected with student mental health. Um, but that's not what, what we ought to be doing. Um, we do our, by far our fastest growing kind of percentage of students is students that identify with mental health concerns. Um, and we are continually working on um, kind of building the community and the relationship with student mental health. Um, there's a number of student groups. Paige would probably be better equipped to talk about this. Student groups that work on issues around mental health and peer counseling and, and just kind of raising awareness about mental health on campus generally, and I think that's really important work also. Yeah, so before I talk about mental health, I want to touch briefly on the original question. Um, I just want to add that not everyone who identifies with a disability or who requires accommodations goes to student accessibility services. A couple of even my peer mentees alone, not even just like 
looking at the whole program, but just the ones who are my mentees have not been registered with Student Accessibility Services, and I've you know suggested that they register and seek accommodations, but not everyone with a disability on this campus does. So that 10% number, it's probably much higher in reality in terms of how many students need some form of accommodation, have some form of disability. Um, I would also add that we also feel like Student Accessibility Services does not have enough resources, and we feel that as a community, we are underrepresented on this campus um, in terms of you know, professors hearing our voices, student groups having our involvement, um, or requesting our involvement, or even taking into consideration the accessibility of the location of an event. Um, we put a section in the Guide for Navigating Disability at Yale that talks about social life on campus, and you know our Secretary of Events, um, Aria, she's fantastic. She is in a wheelchair and she was talking about the accessibility of different frats. Only one frat on this campus is wheelchair accessible, for example. And the fact that that you know, came into conversation in our group is just very interesting that you know, none of these fraternities, sororities have thought about accessibility of their locations. A lot of these social groups that occur off campus, uh, a lot of the events that occur off campus are not in accessible locations and just the lack of involvement and requesting of disabled voices in some of those areas has made it so we can't even enter those spaces. Um, so I think that you know, we are generally, our voices are underrepresented in certain sections of the student population, not across the board, but there are certain areas where you know, the community could do better in terms of listening to us and having us involved. Um, and then to the point about mental health, we as Defy have partnered with a couple mental health groups on campus. Um, so the Yale Layer is a publication that deals with mental health and mental illness on this campus and we have worked with them. Um, we've gotten involved a little bit with formerly known as Mind Matters, I don't know what their new name is, but they're a group that promotes mental well-being on campus. Um, you know, we've worked some, we reached out to the Walden peer counselors, they do peer counseling for students uh, with mental illness, and we've tried in general to be more inclusive of students with mental illness, so the peer mentor program did a bunch of outreach to um, get students with mental illness more involved, and we do have quite a few mentees whose diagnoses are, you know, mental health related. Um, so that is a huge and growing part of our undergraduate advocacy community as well, as those with mental illness. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Is there anybody else? Hi, uh, my name is Mary. I'm a um, rehabilitation physician uh, by training, but uh, Yale School of Public Health um, three years ago. Um, I think this was an excellent seminar today and um, really appreciate the candidness of all of our, um, of our moderator and all of our speakers. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, I think this is a great start. I think this is opening up the conversation here in the Yale community. I think in the state of Connecticut and even um, nationally, we can do so much more. Um, mentioning that next year is the 30th anniversary of the ADA, you know, perfect opportunity, I think, for Yale um, through cross-school collaboration to have a longer seminar to talk about these issues. So I'll throw that out there for... Uh, I would love to participate in that, by the way. I work in New Haven now, not for Yale, but um, I, I think it, it's, it's an opportunity. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for that, uh, that discussion. It was fantastic. I, like my neighbor, was really impressed by what you said, Sarah, about um, you know, a world where your office is not needed. Um, and so when I think about destigmatizing disability, one of the major opportunities I see as a rehabilitation physician um, is recreation and sports. Mm -hmm. And I think there's very few things that are more galvanizing, cohesive, and completely empowering. And so I was just wondering in your office, how many students who have disabilities or who identify as having a disability come to you looking for recreation opportunities on campus and what are those opportunities? And um, if there aren't that many, how do you think they, that might change? And this can go to either Paige or Sarah. So that's an interesting question because in the last year or so, I think we've seen that coming up more and more and more. Um, I think that the biggest way that my office interacts with student athletes is after an injury. <laughs> we, we have met the entire women's rugby team. And, um, so, you know, I think that 
that there's a good awareness of, of what we do generally in the, the student athlete community. We've gotten questions recently about the accessibility of the pool at Payne Whitney and, and things like that. I've recently been opening up connections with administrators in, in the gym to work on issues about accessibility. Um, I think that there's a lot of room for growth, but like so many other things, there is definitely all, all the attitudinal pieces are in place. It's just kind of figuring out how do we make everything as accessible as it can be. Paige might have more information from a student perspective, though. Honestly, not really. I've, you know, I've noticed um, a lot of students are trying to get more involved, especially intramurals, because they're, they're competitive, but less so. Um, that's sort of like a team bonding experience in your residential college. And I think that that creates more community cohesion, which then makes students with various disabilities more likely to pursue intramurals um, as a welcoming space. Uh, I've also noticed that you know some club sports, like uh, there's club swimming and things like that, are probably more accessible, but I haven't seen individuals going those routes. So over the last two years, I was on a club sport, um, I was on the climbing team, and I would love to see something like adaptive climbing, because I know that it exists, and I would love it if we could bring it to this campus. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for improvement in that regard, and since there are so many club and intramural sports, I think there's a lot of different ways in which this campus could have more inclusive opportunities for students with disabilities to partake in recreational activities. Thank you so much. So I think with that, we're probably out of time for today, but I think all of us will be here um, for a little while at least in case you have more questions or comments that you would like to share with us. I want to take this opportunity to thank every one of our panelists, to thank Henry for putting this remarkable group together, and maybe uh, leave us all with uh, the message from uh, my mentor, Professor John Morton Blum, uh, who maybe is as famous for his cameo on the Woody Allen movie, Zelig, as he was for his history courses in 20th century American history, when he said, above all, think, act, be, in the active tense. Thank you so much. <laughs>